When the Lorentz transformation equations are derived in relativity textbooks, the focus is on the algebraic manipulations involved. So naturally, we lose sight of the physical perspective of how these equations come from the fundamental postulates of relativity. We shall elaborate on that in this video. Stick around till the end and you will see that the mathematical forms of the Lorentz transformation equations are completely decided by the fundamental postulates of relativity. Welcome to Physics Next Book. Let's derive the Lorentz transformation equations in a way that relates to the laws of relativity in a tangible physical sense. There are mainly two things we need to figure. First, the orientations that the space and time axis of a moving frame take in a space-time diagram and second, how the scale of length and time in the moving frame differ from those used in the rest frame. Once we sort these two, the Lorentz transformation relations will automatically pop out, you'll see. Let me begin by busting a common misconception. An event does not occur in a particular reference frame. It occurs in the space-time. So it is a unique point P in the space-time. Let's say it is witnessed by observers belonging to two different inertial frames. One is frame S0, that's us, and another is S1 moving uniformly with velocity V relative to us. To identify the event P, observers in S0 and S1 frames assign space-time coordinates to it. Let's denote them by unprimed and primed CTP and XP respectively. How this coordinate assignment is done has already been covered in the channel, link is in the description. Anyway, these primed and unprimed space-time coordinates are related mathematically by what is known as the Lorentz transformation equations. We would like to obtain them from a geometric perspective that gives us some sort of physical insight. So we need to draw the space and time axis of the rest frame and the moving frame in a single space-time diagram. So first, let's see how that is done. Since we are the ones drawing the space-time diagram, our frame S0 is the rest frame and we shall refer to S1 as the moving frame. We have discussed why the space and time axis of the rest frame are drawn mutually perpendicular and take up the horizontal and vertical directions respectively in a space-time diagram in our earlier video. This is important because the world lines of photons and the space and time axis of the moving frame are drawn with reference to the space and time axis of the rest frame. Here is how. We scale our time axis from t to ct, so velocity v, which is dx dt, becomes dx by c dt or v by c, that is in units of light speed. So speed of a photon should be unity. Now speed is given by the slope of the world line with the vertical time axis of the rest frame. Therefore photon world line has to be a 45 degree straight line giving slope delta x by c delta t equals tan 45 equals 1. Any material object or observer moving uniformly relative to the rest frame S0 must have speeds less than that of a photon, so the angle its world line makes with the vertical time axis of S0 frame is less than 45 degree and the corresponding slope representing its speed has to be a fraction. If the relative speed of an observer is 0, then he obviously is in the rest frame S0 itself and his world line has zero slope and it coincides with the rest frame time axis. This means the vertical time axis of S0 is actually the world line of one of us observers belonging to S0. In the same spirit, the time axis of the moving frame S1 is nothing but the world line of one of the S1 frame observers. If he has a uniform relative velocity V by C with respect to S0, then time axis of S1 makes an angle tan inverse V by C with the time axis of S0. The intersection of the time axis of the two frames is chosen to be the common origin of both the frames, denoting it by event O. Passing through O in the horizontal direction is the space axis of our rest frame S0. It represents the collection of events that look simultaneous with event O from our point of view. The space axis of S1 will also pass through O, representing a different collection of events also simultaneous with O but from the perspective of S1 frame observers. And the second postulate of relativity ensures that observers in S0 and S1 have different perceptions of simultaneity. So to draw the space axis of S1, we need to find events that look simultaneous with the origin event O from the perspective or point of view of S1 frame observers. Both the process and the logic that makes it work have been covered in the channel, but for now, let me give you a sneak peek. On the time axis of S1, we take a pair of events that are equidistant from the origin and draw outgoing light path from the event prior to the origin, let's call it emission event E, and incoming light path arriving at the later event named R to signify reception. Where the two light paths intersect is an event S which is simultaneous to O from the point of view of S1 frame observers. Joining S with O, you get the space axis of S1 frame. Notice 
how the light paths that is 45 degree photon world lines and the notion of simultaneity both consequences of the second postulate of special relativity play a crucial role in deciding the orientation of the moving frame space axis now you may have noticed that the angle between the two space axis and that between the two time axis look eerily equal at least visually and they indeed are equal this can be quickly verified just using high school geometry the diagonals of a rectangle cuts each other into four equal parts obviously removing the upper triangle we have a general rule for right angle triangle res a straight line from the midpoint o of the hypotenuse to the right angle vertex s divides the right angle triangle into two isosceles triangles that is triangles oes with equal sides oe and os and triangle ors with equal sides or and os now in our space time diagram the outgoing and incoming light paths form a right angle triangle with the time axis of the moving frame the hypotenuse is along the time axis with origin o being its midpoint so the moving frame space axis is the line connecting the middle of the hypotenuse o to the right angle vertex s thus ose is an isosceles triangle with angles facing the two equal arms being also equal now if you consider a second photon world line emitted from the origin o obviously parallel to the earlier one emitted from event e they create a pair of equal angles with the time axis of the moving frame the space axis of the moving frame also cuts these two parallel photon world lines making another pair of equal angles thus you see the photon world line through the origin o cuts the angle ros into two equal halves and also the right angle between the space and time axis of the rest frame into two 45 degree angles therefore the two leftover angles are obviously equal to each other so the angle between the two time axis belonging to the rest frame and the moving frame is equal to that between the two space axis belonging to the rest frame and the moving frame we have already determined this angle to be tan inverse of v by c coming from the relative velocity v by c of the moving frame s1 with respect to s0 but why is this angle so important because it will help us express x prime p and c prime p the space and time coordinates of event p measured in the moving frame s1 in terms of xp and ctp the space and time coordinates measured in the rest frame s0 let us do it for the space coordinate x prime p first very naively just looking at this diagram x prime p is smaller than xp by a line segment indicated by the curly bracket this segment is the perpendicular arm of a right angle triangle whose base is the time coordinate ctp of event p in the rest frame and the base angle theta is tan inverse of v by c so x prime p is xp minus tan theta times ctp which reduces to xp minus v times tp once we use the value of tan theta which is just v by c in a similar fashion ct prime p is smaller than ctp by a segment of size tan theta times xp or v by c times xp this size is worked out looking at the bottom right angle triangle with base xp thus ct prime p is ctp minus v by c into xp simplifying to t prime p equal to tp minus v by c square into xp but these expressions for x prime p and ct prime p are obtained geometrically by measurements made along the space and time axis of the rest frame s0 in terms of the s0 frame variables hence the scales or units of length and time used in them are of a zero frame but for them to represent space time coordinates of s1 frame correctly we need them in units of s1 frame if you have watched my earlier video on coordinate time and proper time you would know that coordinate time is measured along the rest frame time axis and proper time along the moving frame time axis and for any given value of the proper time the corresponding coordinate time is always bigger by the lorentz factor therefore unit of time or 1 second in s0 frame must be smaller than 1 second in s1 frame by inverse of that same lorentz factor thus the time coordinate value of the event p that is t prime p in the moving frame s1 must be scaled up by the lorentz factor okay but what about the unit along the space axis in s1 again the second postulate of relativity provides the answer it says the speed of light measures the same in the rest frame as well as in the moving frame so if moving frame's unit of time is bigger by some factor so must be its unit of space so that the delta x prime is big enough to match the bigger delta ct prime measured for the photon world line in the s1 frame thus we must also modify the expression for x prime p accordingly that is scale it up by the same lorentz factor and now we have finally got the lorentz transformation relations notice that to get to this point we have used how coordinates of an event are assigned and who assigns them 
world lines of objects, observers, and photons, relative nature of simultaneity, and how the definition of the space axis comes from the concept of simultaneity, and finally, time dilation. I know what you are thinking, or at least most of you are. We need Lorentz transformation equations to derive invariance of space-time interval and the time dilation effect, etc. Obviously. No, you don't. I don't lie to me. Detailed videos on all these concepts are available on the channel as an attempt to develop a physical perspective of how special relativity really works, instead of blindly depending on a mathematical formula like Lorentz transformation relation to tell us everything. Because a formula never tells the whole story, it depends on the context where they are used. If you are new here, I have set up a playlist for you, please have a look and if you have been to this channel before, you already know the drill. I welcome feedback from all of you, let me know in the comments if you have found this video useful or if you have spotted some logical loopholes in them. Until next time, bye bye.